Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you this evening, and I know it's after work, so we're all a little bit tired. So I'm going to try and, and keep this really quite nice and lighthearted. But how to achieve personal growth and to become that empowered leader is my topic this evening. So I thought I'll cover getting you a bit more motivated about building, I call it a connected career. So it's something that you're a bit more motivated to do, something that allows you to feel more present and wake up feeling more motivated but also identify where and why you might be holding yourself back a little bit. And I'm gonna talk about the three essential dimensions for personal growth, which is kind of like the infrastructure that un underpins anything that you do. And then also I wanna to touch on how you have more influence than you think and really get you to start to think. I've actually shared five steps for you to start to persuade and influence people. So, um, so a little bit about me. So I help aspiring professionals, particularly in IT and data, who want to become an empowered leader. You want to become a new generation leader. And I do that by career coaching or by training. And I'm also a head of data part-time now and a mum of two. So I'm, I'm Sue and you can reach out and connect with me over on LinkedIn. Um, but I wanted to start by sharing with you a bit more about my career story because I think there's a lot of lessons throughout my journey that would really help you to avoid some of the pitfalls that I've had. So I'm gonna give you a bit more detail about, about that. now. I always thought that I needed to work hard to climb this career ladder. To me, climbing the career ladder was the only career trajectory. It was the only thing you could do. And it was probably more like that wiggly line that you're seeing in front of you is how I actually got there in the end. But doing this meant I thought that I needed to work harder and longer than anybody else and that that would somehow lead to success. And, and I want to say this is, this is quite a red flag because what happens is people don't see your hard work and your long hours and being the first person in the door, the last person out, the checking of the emails over the weekend and think that you're the person to promote. It doesn't work like that. That's not what anybody's looking for. And that was probably one of the first things that was a bit of a, an eye opener to me. Um, I eventually got this leadership role. And when I finally got there, I felt that I had to prove myself a lot. So I would, be, I would be starting lots of projects, um, agreeing to everything. And I kind of felt that I was, I was challenged quite publicly, sometimes not in a pleasant way in my new role. And immediately this imposter syndrome sort of came down and I thought, I'm not, I can't do this. Who am I to do this role? And I've since learned that, that success or achieving something, and it's quite common for athletes to get this as well, um, even Oscar winners. Oh, if, you've got, if you suffer imposter syndrome, when you achieve something, it can be quite common to all of a sudden have this self-doubt afterwards that everybody's looking at you and they're expecting something from you and you feel that you can't, you can't give anymore. You, you, you somehow are going to get found out and you can't do these things. And that imposter syndrome can really start to weigh quite heavy on you. And it did on me. I have also learned about this Dunning-Kruger effect. And I want to share a little bit of this with you. So this, um, this is the idea that when you know a little bit about something, and I, I just, certainly at the start of my data career, I thought I knew a lot about something, but I knew a little bit about something. And so I had lots of ideas and I was really confident and I would really go out and sell my ideas and, and not really worry too much about anything else. Because that's this person over on the left. This is this person who has a little bit of knowledge, but thinks they have the big picture. You know, when we were teenagers, or if you're the parent of a teenager, that they think they know it all, don't they? They can do everything better than you, and they can take over the company, take over the world and do everything. And that's that, that thing about that little bit of knowledge. Now, the person in the middle is who I became. I realized when I got enrolled, there's a lot more to this. There's an infrastructure. There's a data warehouse I didn't know on Redshift. And I, and I thought it was fine. I would get enrolled and, and I would have the help and support to deal with that. But all of a sudden, I was being asked questions about a data warehouse and a Redshift. And although I'd done the theory of data warehouse design, I didn't know Redshift. I didn't know columnar databases. I didn't understand AWS and their console. So I became very much... Um, this person in the middle who now I had a little bit more knowledge and I was self-doubting. I was, I was critiquing all the stuff I had previously understood or knew because now all of a sudden I couldn't speak out because I was thinking there's, there's still so much more I haven't validated. The person at the end is the professor. This is somebody who knows there's a hell of a lot to this subject, who can sit back, take it all in and then assess it and decide where they, where they feel the answer is. So this this knowledge, knowing that there is this, this situation can really help you to so, sort of understand why you might feel a little bit like that at times. But we all know from, from research that if you are a little bit, if you self-doubt yourself, if you have a little bit of imposter syndrome, 
you're actually more likely to be more competent than your peers that are overconfident and think they know it all. And that's because you're more likely to ask what if. You're more likely to be that inner critic. You're more likely to stop yourself with your crazy ideas and go off and just validate and research and check it a little bit more before you come to the table and suggest that it's a good idea. So if you're really interested in this sort of thing, there's, there's quite a few books that talk about the debate between confidence and confidence, because quite often we see this confident person and that's the person we want to promote and we want to do more things with. But the reality is we need to be looking out for the quietly competent person who just isn't as, as overconfident. So I'm, I'm going to recommend a book called The Con Job, which I can share with you, that talks about this debate between confidence and competence and how we've really we started to, to reward and value the wrong things. So taking you back to my, my first leadership role, this is me. I am like a circus performer with plates spinning everywhere. I have decided I can do a Tableau community to re-engage with our 40 odd Tableau developers across this global business, because I know that they, can, they need to do more. They need more training and help. I've got an improvement plan going. We're going to do some ETL refactor work. We're going to look at our data warehouse and see if it's the right thing. I've got data gaps everywhere. I'm doing training, doing infrastructure review. I'm, I'm thinking data governance is really important. Let's engage in every department across the business to get a data governance set up. And I am a department at this point of three. Um, so I have clearly taken on too much. And I've got, you know, I've got all these plates spinning and what I critically did is, is when one thing started to go wrong and get a bit shaky, I would just divert my attention there. And I was moving from one thing to another so much that nothing was really making much progress. But also the things that my senior leadership team really wanted me to deliver on, I was just failing at. I, I didn't even seem to be able to see them through what I saw as just this, this sea of things that needed doing. So if you can imagine that, um, I've got this Tableau community going and everything else going on. But what I wanted to share with you here is a really famous lesson from Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs, that in 1997, when he went back to Apple, it was this you know, loss making company. It was making a, a billion pound a year loss is what it was making in 1997 when he went back. And it had like loads of projects something like over 40 products. It was doing peripheral devices, it was doing printers, it was doing everything. And when he came in, he immediately got rid of 70% of their product range. And you could think, well, does that matter? But his point was, if we just do a few things really well, we focus, we innovate, we grow, we learn, then we can do less, but we can do it much better. And what is, what is any good in being just mediocre at something and just passable at something. If, if more of us focused on our skills and on the things and the projects that really matter, then we can deliver so much more, but it will really also help you to gain visibility in your organization and the work that you're doing. So I think there's a really valuable lesson there for all of us to really focus on the few and even avoid at all costs the other things that we kind of still keep on our to-do list, don't we? And I remember I used to go in to my director suite and I would present them with all these problems. So I would say, you know, I've done an assessment of this and we need to make some improvements here. And some of them are small and some of them are really quite large. And I remember the directors, many of them being disinterested in what I was sharing with them. And I couldn't understand it at the time. And then one of them shared with me that he had these three rocks and he had to deliver these above all else. These were his three goals, his three rocks for the year. And they might be commercially focused and they might be something else, but he had these three rocks and he had to avoid all the noise at all costs. And his point to me was, the thing you can do, Sue, to help me deliver my rock is you deliver me this dashboard that tells me how long it takes somebody to purchase a device from our company, get it installed, get it activated, and then for me to start making revenue from them. And then how long do I make revenue from them before I start to make a profit because they've actually paid for the device they've had? And I was just missing this picture of focusing on the few and the big wins. So that was really quite interesting as well from my development point of view. So going back to my situation, this didn't twig, this didn't click immediately. At this point, I've still got a million and one things to do. Um, that is not me. I didn't look that good when I had a baby, but I did have a son and he, I was literally doing everything. And I remember the to-do list just kept growing because I'd moved from being a doer to being a leader, but I kept all my doer jobs. I didn't, although my team were perfectly competent, I didn't think they could do what I could do. I didn't think they would do it the way I would do it. 
So I, I kept things and I started to become this bottleneck. If you can imagine all the works coming in and I'm saying, I'm gonna go and I'll do the research and then I'll, I'll do the requirements and then I'll hand it to you. I will go and check out this data source and see how it's structured. And when I figured that out, I'll draw it out and then pass it to you to do the next bit. And as you can see, I just became this bottleneck. I didn't empower people. What eventually started happening, I realized they'd come to me with no confidence in their own decision-making and ask me, what shall I do, Sue? And I realized I'd created this environment where they thought they had to come to me and ask me questions because I, I was controlling so much of the work. I needed to empower and develop my, my team and give them trust and autonomy to get on with it instead of taking it all on. The, the challenge I had is um, I actually started to suffer really bad burnout at this stage. So I would be quite distant at home. I would be quite snappy. Um, I really feel for my then boyfriend at the time. And, and it was kind of felt like it was making a choice all the time. I either work really long hours. I answer these emails late at night. I deal with these, these, these questions or, or I do a bad job, but I have, I have a home life. It was a choice. And, and that's what didn't really fit with me. Is, is, is feeling like it was a choice. So eventually I did suffer quite bad burnout. Um, it manifested itself quite physically. Um, I didn't realize it would do that in that you, you suffer insomnia and your heart feels like it's beating out of your chest and your head doesn't switch off. It's all foggy and fuzzy. And if you're feeling like that, then I would urge you to just stop and just take yourself away and, and really get, get focused. There, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, that was a really bad time in my life. But what it did is it forced me into this road of what are you going to do about this? You're not happy in this life. You've got to do this better. You, can, you know, you always had this vision of being a better leader. But for some reason, the, the, you know, I was in protection mode. I was in safety mode. And all my ideas are gone and my vision, everything. I just couldn't think. I was in this very fixed scarcity mindset place and I needed to do some serious work. And that's when I became really probably geeked out on neuroscience um, anything personal development, personal growth wise that was out there, I would just read it. And then I would re read about research about how we, we have these different parts of our brain, the prefrontal cortex and things like that to really try and understand, well, where does, where, where do we somehow get this from? And, and I know that this, this personal development, and I also started working with a coach that really helped. And prior to that, I did have a mentor. My experience of a mentor was slightly different than, than many of you have perhaps had in that it, it I didn't find it as supportive. Um, I found it more a, you need to come to me to show you. I found it more of a pressure. So I, perhaps that's because I needed somebody external to this business so that they, I could have a safe environment where I could talk about what I was dealing with through logically with somebody who was, who was not going to judge me for being no good at my job. And that was the fear is that I would be no good at my job and I would lose this role. Now, some people talk about there being two stages to your career, but I believe there are three. So the first stage is this like learning and experience stage, and that starts really early on. The second stage I talk about is this where you have this realization of identity in it. And people who've been through a significant amount of personal development and growth have probably touched in this. And I think you, got, you ladies were talking about this before, about this realization of what, what, what direction do I want to be in versus what, what path have I been driven down or have or outside perspectives are changing my view of the world and what I can do. And we obviously struggle a lot with bias as well. And then I have this, this thing I call the true calling, but really you can call it anything. It's, it's following a path where you're in full flow. You enjoy, you know, to me, the goal is I want to wake up motivated and I want you to too. And I want you to come home feeling really fulfilled. Like when you come home feeling fulfilled, I know I'm a better mum. I know I'm a better wife. I know I can compartmentalize and close off the day and feel I did my best. I, I'm going to show up again tomorrow, but that this really means something. And um, some people don't follow their true calling, but they do something called an adjacent career where you do something that supports the career of the role that you'd really like to do, but you perhaps have some limitations. So I read this survey last year that, you know, we spend 90,000 hours in our life in work. It's such a big chunk of it. But 70% of people in this survey done by Gallup were, were saying they were disconnected. They were disengaged with the work they did. And, and that really, really shocked me and also, you know, concerned me because I thought, how can so many people get up every day and feel such, so like that? That, that, that? that doesn't need to happen. And that's really where I started to question things. So... Thinking about that first stage in your career, 
just very quickly have a little think about the types of things that your parents told you or that your teachers told you that you were perhaps good at or you were perhaps suitable for. Um, I always got told I was bossy. Um, I always got told, you know, the stereotypical things that a woman shouldn't be. And I probably then became a leader that thought I needed to be bossy because that was the perception of what I'd always been told I was. Um, and I was lucky, I got told I was always good at IT and computers. So I did go into a tech career, whereas so many girls are sort of steered away from it. So there's all that sort of gender, gender sort of balance thing going as well. And then in your first job, you know, you start by being a trainee and that feels fine because you're early, you're in your 20s, you perhaps just come out of uni or something and you're okay to be learning. And then some people do the, the, the Kruger effect that I talked about earlier on, they rise on that bit of confidence with a little bit of knowledge and they will accelerate, they will, they will promote themselves really quickly through that phase. But other people stay stuck and what you do is you start to train the new people but eventually you reach a point and some people, you know, people in their 30s come to me all the time and say, so I'm too old to retrain. I'm too old to do something new or to learn something else. And that's that fixed mindset that we think perhaps socially that it's unacceptable to be learning and training as we get older. And I think that's less and less common these days. We are, we are accepting of the fact that we've got to learn and develop. But earlier on, you might have been stuck for a while and still have this view that, that you should be now confident and competent you're now 30 you should be doing everything you should be doing when the reality is at 30 you've only just started haven't you to get into those next phases so this is that the first stage of our career where you know and our and our lives where limiting beliefs can start to form based on our experiences and things we're told um, rejection we can either take it one way or the other you know some people have got used to rejection and failure, they become resilient to it. And others, we haven't experienced it very much. That means if we were to be made redundant, it would be a big shock to us. We wouldn't know how to handle it. Uh, rejection in terms of failing at interviews. Imposter syndrome can start to sit on us um, and all those sorts of things. And we internalize all these things. But meanwhile, on the outside, we, we know there are things out there like bias and judgment. And at the moment, there's COVID and restructure and redund redundancies and economies that we feel we can't have any impact on at all. And some of those things, you know, COVID is happening and we need to choose how to respond to it. So from your career, it can feel like you've got this tunnel vision. You've got this early stage. And until you've done some personal development, you've worked with somebody else, you've opened your eyes or sometimes you have a breakthrough. Some people, it can be a death in the family, it can be an illness, it can be having a children, all sorts of things can really make you sort of sit up and take notice and think, actually, this, this tunnel is not the only way. It just feels like these are my only options. Perhaps some of you can relate to this, this feeling that I can only do one thing, or you've been there where you you know there feels like there's limited options you have responsibilities you have a mortgage now you have children it fits with everybody else's life your partner expects you to earn this amount of money I can't possibly earn less to do something else or whatever it is that makes you feel a bit limited perhaps you've seen that only a certain type of person is promoted in your organization and therefore your face doesn't fit um, and there's an awful lot of that that goes on in the corporate sector and, and it's very very interesting when we've had these sessions to see the difference as well between public and private sector. So NHS, for example, and I work with a lot of people who work in education and that can be very well balanced um, depending on where you are. So it's, it's quite interesting how we internalize those things and we then limit our own options based on it. So this is the, the three stages. We've gone through this learning phase. We're going through this stage of figuring out what our identity is. Our identity, we tie very much to, you know, to it gives us this clarity it's who we are it's our values it's what matters to us and it's really thinking about the type of life you're trying to build if you were to remove all the limits about what I can do what I can't do all that kind of stuff until you get your true calling and I think when you go through this level of personal development and you work through something with an outside influence particularly it's like it's liberating it opens your eyes and I like this this video because it's sort of it's, it's a, just a metaphor for how freeing and how the sky sort of lifts when you realize, actually, I could have a go at that. I could do that. Yeah, I would like to go for that. And, and you feel like the walls have been opened up and you start to come out of yourself more. You know, there's been a lot of research to suggest when people go through these phases, 
that you come out and you are a better performer because you're more present, you're more connected to what you do, and you're in, you're in full flow when you really got that clarity and you know what it is that you want to do. Unfortunately, though, 40%, according to some studies, it even suggests up to 70%, but I thought that's unbelievable. I'm going to put 40%. 40% of leaders, and I was nearly one of them, fail within the first 18 months. And unfortunately, a lot of this, these people are, are people that don't come from the status quo group. So that's you know, your typical white male from top universities, middle class. There is quite a, 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 so, a social impact here as well. And, you know, much of that is about getting people supported, getting people that infrastructure around them. And I like to think that although I've quoted about leadership there, I actually think that everybody is a leader these days because in technology, certainly you have the power to make some decisions that will drive and steer the, the direction of your research, the direction of your development, your product. You know, you're, you're part and parcel of these critical decisions, but you're also you're a role model to other people around you. You know, we are we are very much in a privileged position working in this sector. We have a lot more influence and control than we realize. So when I think of the new generation leader, I actually think we have we need leaders at all levels to behave in the leadership way. And these are the sorts of traits that I believe you need to exhibit or the types of things that I thought I'd brainstorm. So First of all, I talk about going from a victim. So a victim being somebody that somebody has decided for you whether you're worthy of a promotion. Somebody has decided for you what course you're going to do, how you're going to develop, all the things that happen to you into a role model. And a role model mindset is I'm in control. I can show other people the way. I can demonstrate the way. I can learn something and I can develop and I can determine my future. So role modeling versus the victim mindset that I can't control everything that happens to me. Uh, that person inspires others. I talk about inspiring others and having a positive impact. I think that that person is often determined. Many of you are here because you're determined to build relationship, build your network, build your career. You're, you're, showing, you're showing up for yourself. You're showing up to inspire others. You're trying to learn and grow as you go along. You recognize that need. I think this person also has a conscious awareness of the micro and macro world around them. So when I say micro, I mean your team, your emotional intelligence. So me recognizing that by doing working the way I was, I wasn't empowering my team. What else are we doing that, that's, that's not responding to the emotional needs of our team? I was speaking to a lady the other day who, whose family live in India and are going through this pandemic, this terrible crisis, and her work, just still expected her to turn up at the same time didn't even mention it to her knowing that her family are over there in this crisis and every evening she's on the phone and checking everybody's safe and well and quite worried and that's that level of emotional intelligence that says I know there's a big world out there I know there's more to you and your life that's going on that I'm, we need to be aware of and we need to be supporting not just this thing that's happening in in work right now and I think this, this new generation leader is very self-aware. They, they value health, they value others, and they also value competence. So we talk about competence and confidence and, and, and generating and valuing and, and developing your competence. So I think it's quite interesting how the, the new professional, this highly skilled professional that you are, you know, we're starting to realize that we have more control. We have we have more of a way to dictate the way we want to work. And they actually interviewed some workers um, in the States, this was, and 50% of them actually said they expected to be self-employed in their career and not employed. And I think that's a very interesting shift in the trend where we're saying, you know what, I want to work on my terms. I want to work on the projects that I choose. And this is just showing how we're starting to take more control as individual professionals as well. So. When I went through this period of, of personal growth and um, a lot of research, one things that st stood out to me is that there were patterns. There was an infrastructure that these people had. And I also started to work quite closely with our directors. And I realized that they had a certain level of executive coaching and a certain level of training that really underpinned a lot of the things that we don't do. Because what we do is we focus so much on the hard skills. So you're probably learning to code in Python or something. And 
like me, I was so focused on, I must just figure out this, this data warehouse. But the reality is there were so many more elements that needed to underpin my development in order for me to be this strong and influential leader. So I'm gonna run through those three now. Um, so the first one, mindset. So Henry Ford quote on there, whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, you are probably right. And that's, that's true of anything. If you can't see it, if you can't see that it will happen, it's not going to happen. If you've got that fixed mindset, I was talking to somebody only a couple of weeks ago. They, they'd learned Excel. They were fantastic on Excel. I was trying to persuade them to do some training with my team on Tableau. I can't do that, Sue. I can't learn Tableau. And that's that fixed mindset. If you tell yourself you can't, then you can't. But you learn Excel. So I'm persuading this person to see themselves as you probably can, but until you tell yourself you can, you're always going to attempt each, each training activity with the attitude that you can't do it. Um, it helps us to feel more confident when we have a stronger mindset and more comfortable. We can feel happier. We, when we have this mindset where we're abundant. So earlier on, I talked about being very scarcity mindset. There's not e I'm in competition with everybody. There's not enough jobs to go around. The, the economy is so bad. When you're in this scarcity mindset, you can't grow. You need to feel abundant and abundant means I have skills. I can get a job. I'm good. I'm talented. I know what I can do. There's enough for everybody. If I support my colleagues, then they'll support me. And that's the difference between a scarcity and an abundant mindset that can really help you to feel happier. And then I've got there the fixed and growth mindset. There's a really great author, Carol Dweck, well, a researcher who talks all about believing that you can learn. So going back to that Tableau developer, trying to persuade her that she can learn this tool versus the fixed mindset that says, I can't possibly learn. I'm in a fixed position. You're always growing. Every day is another opportunity to grow. And then the next one is all about this clarity. When we know, so going back to that identity, we have this purpose-driven identity. We know why we're doing something and we know what it means to us. We're very clear on our values. And we know when something rubs up against our values and, and pulls, us, pulls us in different directions. So for example, working long hours might rub, against, rub up against your values to be a really good family member. It might be that something is happening at work that you don't think is very inclusive and that can rub up against your values. But also knowing what it is you wanna get from work. So we each have different pushes and pulls. At the beginning of my career, I thought, this title, this status, that was what I needed to, to feel fulfilled. The reality is it didn't work. It doesn't work like that. I actually realized later on that I need to feel that I'm making a difference. I need to feel that I'm contributing to something that's bigger. And perhaps you do too. I also need to feel that I'm growing and developing all of the time. Maybe you need to feel a connection to people and that's really important to you. There's also about being having this clarity when you're looking forward, you're, you're, you're expecting that it's not fixed. Where I am now is just one position in time. But if I look forward, I'm more positive, regardless of what's happened in the back past. I could have been made redundant. I could have been rejected from job interviews. When I'm looking forward, I'm more forward focused. I'm more positive. And when I have that clarity, you can obviously make better decisions because you know exactly what it is you should be looking at. So going back to that, if I focus on my three rocks, which three rocks should I be focusing on? Well, you can only determine that when you've got clarity over what it is that you're trying to achieve. There's a nice quote here from Brian Tracy that I remind my husband of frequently when he wants to spend lots of money on things that we don't need. And that is long-term thinking improves short-term decision-making. If there's something you wanna be doing in the future, it's your big, your big goal, and you've decided today that you're not gonna do that course, or you're not gonna invest in that, or you're, you're not going to sign up for something or join a meetup when you know you need to build your network because in two years time, you wanna change jobs, you wanna do something else, then, then you're, you're making a mistake by not thinking long-term. So always think long-term when you're making your decisions. And then the last one is about support. Uh, the last infrastructure piece, this thing that you're doing now by attending this meetup, you're starting to build your network, you're being really proactive, by having the support, so a little graph actually down there, over, well, over the pandemic, even before this, our support was going down because we're so busy, our lives are busy, we don't have that same community thing that you would have had in the 1950s, 
you know, life has got really busy. And although we have social media and you might have 5,000 friends on Instagram, it doesn't necessarily mean you're in, they're in your corner and they're there for you in a supportive framework when you need some childcare or you need some support at home for something that's going on. It's a very different world now. But the pace of change is just going up. You know, the pace of change in technology has always been going up. We're quite used to it. But the ch pace of change because of the pandemic has just, has just accelerated tenfold. So to increase opportunities, forgive my typo there, we need more allies, more sponsors. We need safe places, safe communities like this where you can explore ideas and perhaps that's a supportive peers or coach, a mentor. I talked about having somebody outside of my immediate work where I could go and talk about the, you know, I've got this idea, am I crazy? What do I need to do next to get it out of my head in a safe place? This can really help you feel more resilient to change and more able to deal with things. Now, we often think of Sheryl Sandberg as, as the COO of Facebook as being you know, an incredibly successful woman in our industry. And we know that she had supportive family. She had you know, sponsorships throughout her university. She had a hell of a lot going for her. And it's just one example of how you, perhaps we, we don't have those same things. We don't have, have those opportunities. We probably don't have the same support from our parents or from our partners because they've got a lot going on as well. They've got their own goals. And it's you trying to build that same supportive network around you by connecting with others, lifting others up. And she does this as well. You know, this is, this is another example of a woman who, instead of holding other women back or holding other people back, they lift people up. And that's what we need more of, people helping people as well and building a supportive network. So being, yeah, being more resilient to handling changes is incredibly important and building your supportive network is one of the areas. Right, now we talk about influence. So I've talked a lot about getting strong yourself, working on your identity, working on getting more connected, getting clarity, building support. But the, all that can really help you with one of your core skills. And that is the ability to be able to persuade the people around you to support you, to support your ideas. That might be when it comes to a promotion, that might be um, solutions um, that you want to put on the table. It might be a pay rise or just getting general recognition, people to understand and have visibility of what you do and investment. And I want to talk about why you might have more influence than you already think. So in this internal space, this is your internal circle of influence, you have a really strong sense of self. When you have a really strong sense of awareness of who you are, you've got clarity, you've got self-belief, and you're resilient. And then you've got that growth mindset. You've got the mindset that I can learn it. If I don't know it now, I can learn it, I can pick it up. You're developing your competence. You're very grateful, you're very abundant, and you're forward focused. Then that can help you to build visibility because you're showing up braver and bolder. You're sharing what you do. You've got this strong sense of self and clarity about what you want to put out there, what messages, what relationships you want to build. You're starting to get visibility. You're being empathetic with others and you're building the relationships and you're role modeling the way. Then you can start to impact on the thoughts and beliefs of others and what their ideas and expectations. Every single one of you that is taking on a new role, that is doing something fantastic, that is trailblazing, you are, you are a role model to other people who are watching. And, and also you're showing senior people or status quo that this, this, is actually, this is absolutely what should be happening. This is absolutely doable. You know, anyone from any background, any diverse background can do these things. I'm gonna show you, this is me. I'm from a strong sense of self. I've got this self-belief. I've done this personal growth and development. So I can show up clearer i can show up bigger and i can show up bolder and i can start to change the expectations of what we expect of each of us to see because when you feel strong there's massive writing here when you feel strong really important you expand your circle of influence when you come from that position of strength and that's why i value personal growth so much it's not about being selfish it's not about me saying i'm gonna hire myself away and do a load of work on me because me 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 is all important it's about when you when you are that person you show up so much better for everybody else. You know, I know that by doing that work on me, I show up better for my family, I, I role model the way better, and I show up better at work. But that can help us to control those other things that we thought we couldn't, the bias and all those other things. 
And you've probably already starting to influence other people by saying phrases like, have you noticed? And that's you helping other people to see the way that it is, to, to see that your, your solution might be good. Have you noticed the work we do? Have you noticed that this happens when we do this? And it's you starting to influence. So I'm running out of time here now. Um, this is, I'm gonna give you five steps to influence. So that is, start by strengthening your inner circle. We talked about that a lot. Build no like and trust. What do you wanna be known for? What do you want people to like you for? Be likable, be trustworthy. If you say you're gonna do something, follow up on it, be congruent. Build no like and trust. Identify what's in it for them. No, before you even go in a meeting where you wanna influence somebody, know what's in it for them. You know, I talked about this, that director. He just wanted to know that I was gonna deliver something that would be for his goal. What's in it for them? Make the suggestion seem obvious. I'm gonna suggest we do this. It seems obvious. This is what you want to happen. This is what we know about me and my capability and gain agreement. Five really simple steps to look at how you might influence somebody next time you want to ask for a promotion, you want to ask for support on your project or investment. Now, I've crammed an awful lot into 30 minute session, 35 minutes, I've run way over, um, all about visibility, influence, impact. And what I've done is I've actually created a little mini training series over on my website, elitedigitalspace.com. So if you want to sign up, for that you can do otherwise if you want to connect with me on linkedin or instagram i'm now on there and i also run the podcast empowered leaders in tech and if you'd love to be featured then i would love to feature you thank you very much folks <laughs>